Crisis Group has been working on Somalia since 2002 from our office in Nairobi, and we frequently travel to the country for research purposes. Conditions in Somalia have improved. Amazon, now including Kenya, has, with the help of Ethiopia, the Somali National Army, the Sufi group al Sunnah wal Jama, and various allied clan militias, dealt al Shabaab a serious strategic setback. Somalia also has a new, albeit provisional, government that is qualitatively better than previous administrations. The international community quickly recognized this government, and in September it pledged $2.5 billion in support. However, the federal government only has de facto control over Mogadishu and parts of the south. Al-Shabaab is down, but not out. It controlled youth swaths of south and central Somalia, and it still is able to hit high-profile targets. The government also needs donors to pay its security forces and to rebuild. Security in Mogadishu and elsewhere remains dependent on Amazon and will likely for some time to come. Neither Amazon nor the government can impose a peace. Stability is only possible through a nationwide process of negotiation, power sharing, and improved governance. Arguably, Somalia's most intractable, intractable issue is the question of federalism. Simply put, there remains serious disagreement between those who would like to see Somalia become a strong unitary state, one that can stand up to its neighbors, and those that fear a centralized government would be dominated by a single clan or group of clans, as it was during the Siad Barra era. Agreement on the powers of the federal government need to be thrashed out quickly, otherwise Somalia risks embarking on a disruptive piecemeal approach in the establishment of local administrations and federal states. The federal government quickly ran into trouble on the issue of federalism in Jubaland in southern Somalia, which was exacerbated by ambiguity in the constitution about who leads the process of creating these states. Neighboring countries also have significant security interests in Somalia, and all have sizable forces in the country. Beyond the Horn, Muslim Somalia is very much linked to the Middle East, and Egypt, Qatar, and Turkey are very active in the country. Ethiopia is Somalia's historic rival. Addis Ababa, promoting its own system of ethnic federalism, is a strong proponent of federalism and a seemingly logical bottom-up approach of state building in Somalia. However, many Somalis see this as a ploy to keep their country weak and divided and are thus wary of international pressure to devolve power. Kenya forcefully intervened in 2011 to create its own buffer state and facilitate the return of nearly half a million Somali refugees. It subsequently joined Amazon, but often follows its own interests. In Jubaland, Kenya has thrown its support behind Ahmed Madobe and not the federal government. Publicly, Kenya is looking for an exit, but Somalis view this claim with great skepticism. According to the UN Monitoring Group, Kenya, Kenyan politicians and officers are earning money from the trade, including banned charcoal passing through Kismayo, and more important, most believe Kenya wants to control southern Somalia because it has large oil and natural gas deposits. Al-Shabaab is aggressively trying to turn the local population against what it calls Christian Kenyan occupiers, and the Westgate Mall attack was an attempt to trigger a crackdown to that end. Beyond the regional states, a number of Muslim countries have taken an active interest in Somalia. This greater regional interest allows Somalia to play different states off against each other, particularly Muslim states against Ethiopia. International cooperation is also complicated by a host of international organizations, including the UN, the African Union, and EGAD, the regional organization in East Africa, with no clear division of responsibilities or a lead actor. The greatest problem was, and arguably remains, the overlapping mandate of the AU and the UN. The AU has the military peace enforcement responsibility, but by virtue of having been in Mogadishu for the last four years and fielding a force of over 17,000 troops, is a major political actor. While the UN has a political mandate, it is very much involved in security policy, security rec sector reform, and the vexing issue of federalism. Both missions are also headed by special representatives who reportedly get on well, but they and their staff have no clear instructions on how to share responsibilities. The Westgate Mall attack. Much has been written about the latest terrorist attack. It is, however, important to note that this has long been expected, and it was certainly not the first, only the most destructive. It is important that the Kenyan government prevent a backlash against its Somalian Muslim population, lest it does exactly what al-Shabaab was seeking. What did the U.S. do in the opinion of crisis group? 
First of all, it should support and prioritize nationwide negotiations on the type of federalism this federal government will implement and insist that the formation of new states adhere to a rule-based process. It should continue to support local and regional administrations' capacity building, but this must be linked to reconciliation and measures to ensure minority clans are adequately represented in those governments. Currently, it is very difficult for aid agencies to provide development assistance in insecure areas, yet it is in these areas where assistance can be of the greatest benefit. Congress should consider supporting a smaller, high-risk but high-reward fund managed by the Office for Transition Initiatives for symbolic projects in Somalia's periphery. Congress should also note that the 2016 elections are not far away. They are already behind schedule, and election assistance should be quickly funded by donors. More attention should also be given to countering radicalization in Somalia and the Horn. The U.S. should be giving quiet assistance to such programs. The U.S. government should also place much greater emphasis on reconciliation, both with armed factions and on a national level between clans. It should provide support for local peace and reconciliation conferences that can feed into larger regional conferences. It should also provide the new UN mission, UNSOM, with all the capacity necessary to coordinate assistance effectively. And it should insist that the federal government does so effectively as well. The State Department and DOD should also start working with AMISOM to clearly articulate a multi-year exit strategy for its intervention in Somalia. And this should be linked with incremental support to the creation of a professional mixed clan national army. Lastly, the U.S. should convene an international working group to help create a transparent mechanism to monitor revenue collection in Somalia's major ports and airports, including an oversight board with a mixed international and Somali composition and supported by experts, as was done in Liberia, to ensure that port revenue is used to develop all regions in Somalia equitably. In conclusion, Somalia remains an extremely weak and fragile state. Its security is dependent on external sources, its sovereignty is threatened, and its stability is far from certain. Yet it is at an inflection point where the hope of achieving sustainable progress is becoming real, if and only if the international community works together toward that goal and Somalis honestly confront the government's challenges facing their country. I thank you and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Hugendorn. Um, let me start with your last uh, of many recommendations first, then uh, work back to the previous. Um, first, uh, I'll ask of all three of you a question about sort of the security situation and the financing of Al-Shabaab and what are the strategic um, challenges we face. And then second, about federalism. All three of you had some interesting uh, comments about federalism. On the first question, uh, my sense is that Al-Shabaab has been principally financed uh, through the charcoal trade when they controlled Kismayu and uh, parts of the coastline uh, and through the extraction of taxes uh, from uh, those communities they control. Um, and the UN Monitoring Group, I think, recently described how the regional charcoal trade uh, helps finance Al-Shabaab. Um, what should we be doing um, here forward to ensure that Al-Shabaab loses the financial support to continue operations? Um, and what do you see as the most um, important next steps to strengthen Amisom to actually carry out its mission of stabilizing the security of the country? to make possible a transition to a, a broadly representative, inclusive, and professionalized uh, Somali national forces. Excuse me. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the, charcoal, the charcoal trade is actually banned by the UN Security Council. And I think that the United States should do more to force its partners uh, to, in fact, adhere to those um, prohibitions. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the real challenge with Amazon is that it has essentially reached uh, a point where it is it is it is extended to the point that 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 it can no longer push far, farther out, and either the, um, the international community needs to provide more resources to Amazon uh, to increase its its troop capacity and to inc tr in, um, improve its ability to to reach out, or I think more needs to be done on on the political side to try to stabilize Somalia from um, a, a political perspective. Um, there seems to be a real tension between uh, a desire for a strong national government um, to be able to resist intrusion from Ethiopia, from Kenya, uh, sort of meddling by outside forces, one perception goes. On the other hand, there's uh, a suspicion of a strong uh, federal or national government because of experiences under the Siad Barre government, because of the strength of clans and because of the very different 
uh, uh, cultural uh, and political traditions across the country. Um, managing these with a, a constitution that in its current form has significant internal contradictions around what the federal structure should look like is quite difficult. It is very different from our own Articles of Confederation period, but there are some striking similarities uh, in that moving towards a healthy and functioning national government for purposes of security, um, taxation, control of ports, control of trade uh, is necessary, but there are significant um, internal concerns that mitigate against uh, a strong unitary federal government. What role should the U.S. government be playing in advancing a federal structure and did our dual track policy um, actually hurt that process? And what do you recommend for U.S. policy with regards to federalism and implementation going forward, if you could? Well, I mean, as we know here in the United States, federalism remains an extremely contentious issue, uh, even in these hallowed halls. Um, I, I mean, I, I would agree with, with, with Andre Lesage and Abdi Ainti that, uh, you know, perhaps we need to recast the dual track approach as perhaps the parallel approach. But I think the, the important point that I would make is that if the money cannot go to Mogadishu alone, if it goes to Mogadishu, it stays in Mogadishu as it is currently mostly doing. Um, all the, the progress that we're seeing in Somalia is largely in Mogadishu, and that's because all the resources that are being pledged uh, to these countries are, are, are largely staying in the capital. Um, that's to some degree understandable. I think when the federal government is trying to do things, it's easier to do stuff in the capital than it would be to do place, in places far away, especially when they don't have formal links with these kinds of, of, of local administrations or they are in very hostile uh, relationships with them as they have been with Jubaland uh, and continue to be with Jubaland. I think the important point that people need to recognize is that Al-Shabaab benefits from these disagreements and it benefits from these tensions and one of the biggest problems that we have in Jubaland is that while Jubaland is, is somewhat more stable and it is, it is arguably uh, less of a safe haven for Al-Shabaab, the fact that Jubaland is being dominated by a single clan allows al-Shabaab to recruit from minority clans who feel that they're not being adequately represented by those local administrations. And to some degree, al-Shabaab is waiting that game in other areas as well, waiting to see those political tensions come to the fore and using that as an effective recruiting tool uh, to, 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 to rebuild their ranks. Thank you. The last panel was talking about the uh, government there and uh, mentioned at one point, referred to it as a democratically elected government. Um, uh, it's not quite that simple. Um, how is it viewed uh, in the rest of the country? I know going back to, what was it, 98 or so, with the first attempt to appoint traditional elders who would appoint uh, a constituent assembly of some type or the last kind of iteration of this experience and it didn't take hold, what makes this different here? Why, why uh, is this government going to be viewed uh, uh, is there anything different than the last attempt? Mr. Hagenor? Or is it? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I, I think, or I would agree with everyone, or most observers, that there were very significant flaws with the selection process. Uh, that said, I think that there was uh, a, lar a greater attempt to ensure that at least the majority of the elders who were, who, who were at this constituent assembly, who then picked the parliament, yeah. who then selected the president were at least somewhat more represented than they had been in the past. Okay. It was, certainly wasn't, a, wasn't a, um, a perfect process. There were lots of um, uh, allegations of, of vote buying, of vote rigging, of, of, right. of, of extortion and so on and so forth. I, I think people focus mostly on the fact that the, the, the prime minister and the president who were selected, or at least the president who was elected and then the prime minister who was selected were both notably not involved in the civil war okay. in any major way. And, and so this was kind of seen as, as a bit of a break from the past. And, and to be perfectly honest, um, the president especially was someone who came from civil society, who we had worked with in the past, who many of us had worked with in the past. And we're, we're quite excited about that possibility. Uh, that certainly doesn't mean that the government is, right. is perfect, but, but we certainly see it as, as a, 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 an improvement on, on past regimes. The previous panel spoke some about uh, the model uh, of an African-led uh, indirect action by the United States financing an African-led multilateral force as being a, a possible role model for multilateral action for regional security. 
um, if we are at this sort of point of inflection uh, where Amisom either um, succeeds or fails, and if actions like the attack uh, in Nairobi uh, put significant pressure on regional partners like Uganda, um, Kenya, Djibouti, Ethiopia, um, how vital is it for uh, our interests on the continent and uh, globally, how vital is it for Somalia's future that Amisom succeed and that the regional partners um, continue to get bilateral support from the United States um, to stay engaged in this fight and to not withdraw? Well, as I mentioned in my testimony, I, I believe, as, as Dr. Andre Lesage mentioned, that absent Amisom, it is quite likely that the Somali national government would collapse. Uh, and I think that Amisom has done a remarkable job over the last three or four years uh, to push al-Shabaab back at enormous cost in, in blood and treasure uh, to the troop-contributing countries. I think that the, the largest char challenge really to some degree is that while this has been a very effective military operation, uh, the AU at the moment still lacks the capacity to kind of make this both an integrated political and military operation, which is why, you've, why we've created this kind, of, um, this kind of unwieldy hybrid between the UN, which is a political mandate, and the AU, which is a, has, a, has a, a military mandate. And it's always, had, it's always been very, very difficult to try to kind of meld those two organizations together since, you know, they have different cultures. They oftentimes have, have different leaders who sometimes don't get along, sometimes they do get along. Um, currently, um, the UN has transitioned to a new mission uh, with a new secretary, uh, special representative for the secretary general. Um, that mission was just established in June, uh, so it's very early for us to be able to see how that will work. He does have instructions from uh, the UN Security Council to cooperate with the AU. Those, those instructions are not very clear, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, and I think it remains kind of a work in progress. Uh, and unfortunately, as I think all of my colleagues would agree, ultimately the solution in Somalia needs to be a political one, and that Amazon needs to work within a political framework uh, to achieve that goal, uh, and kind of melding those two um, uh, organizations and, and have them working towards the same goal has and will continue to be a challenge.